So our pa for our panel on ecological grief, uh, I'm going to welcome the first of our three speakers, Yan Wang Preston, who's going to speak about With Love from an Invader. Over to you, Yan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, I think I'm, to I'm going to talk about um, an ongoing body of work really started from last year called With Love from an Invader. Just before I start sharing my screen, I think I'll just tell you a little bit about me, which you can see I'm from China. I came here in uh, 2005, 16 years ago. So uh, I think that position of um, not being actual English or British um, seem to have become quite important in this project. Um, so now I'll um, share my screen window. Okay. Um, just to say that uh, it, because it's very much um, you know an ongoing uh, series of work I'm developing, a lot of my um, understanding is quite partial, I believe. Um, so uh, you know I welcome uh, criticism and um, also knowledge from the audience. Um, so with love from an invader, really this line is from. Um, my reflection on some of the comments I read uh, about one particular plant, rhododendron. Obviously, it, it's a massive genus of uh, species. Um, but we can see the, the different comments I collected here. You know, for example, in 1823, um, Henry Phillips says, the introduction of a useful or ornamental plant into our island is justly considered as one of the most important services that a person can render his country. <laughs> and then, you know, 20, more than 20 years later, late 19th century, uh, Joseph Dalton Hooker, who became um, the director of um, Kew Gardens later, um, he said in his uh, acclaimed book, um, The Rhododendrons of the Sikkim Himalaya, you know, he says, perhaps with the exception of the rose, the queen of flowers, no plants have excited more interest throughout Europe than the, serv the several species of the genus rhododendron. So rhododendron at the time really was seen as the king of flowers. Uh, you know, any self-respected uh, person, the landed, the noble, would have to have some rhododendrons in their gardens. And fast forward one half centuries. In 2010, this, this quote is from for, 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 Forestry and Land, um, go, Scotland, but you see these kind of sentences everywhere. In 2010, we set out our vision to remove rhododendron from Scotland's national forests and land. Since then, we've been using chainsaws, herbicides, heavy machinery and considerable human muscle power in the battle against this unwelcome alien. <laughs> For me, it's fascinating to see the perception of rhododendron uh, changed, you know, throughout this time. It was introduced by the botanic, uh, colonial botanists into this country as ornamental, uh, ornamental plant. And now it's seen as an uh, alien and invasive species. I happen to be a foreigner. This line of this unwelcome alien does, does, doesn't sound very nice to me. And so that kind of got me thinking. You know, for example, um, Jordan Dendron is native in China. Apparently, according to my limited research at this stage, um, the first book that uh, mentioned rhododendron uh, in China was this, uh, this book called Shennong Herbal Classic. It was published uh, in the Han Dynasty. So Han Dynasty is quite a long dynasty. It, it, it started in 206 BC and it finished in 220 uh, AD. Um, so basically the plant is known to our culture for thousands of years. And in this book, it mentioned this particular rhododendron is a yellow azalea because um, it's uh, poisonous. 
And I think after that, uh, rhododendron as a plant, also as a bird, the, the cuckoo in Chinese shares the same name as rhododendron. They frequently appear in our literature, poetry and paintings. Um, so it's a native and much loved plant in China. So, uh, you know, I, I sense this thing about when you say something's non-native. In, in, when I talk to ecologists, I learned that um, if only judged from an ecological um, angle, then invasion, uh, eco ecological invasion has nothing to do whether, uh, with whether a plant is native or not. So I sense that there might be something connected. The, <laughs> you know, um, perhaps it's nationalism. There's something about the British identity, maybe, that, um, you know, basically it's very easy to blame something that is supposed to be an outsider. Um, it just so happened that last year, um, when I was thinking about starting on a project with uh, rhododendrons, um, I don't know if you remember, or perhaps even if you noticed, that uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of uh, racism towards, um, you know, East Asian people, particularly Chinese people. And uh, I think living here, we felt it, we meaning the Chinese people living here, we felt it on a personal level. Um, so I think it's, I've, I had all this going on with my mind, um, you know, when I thought, okay, what am I, what, what can I do? And the atmosphere last year in March was uh, very tense. And on the 16th of March uh, last year, Boris Johnson asked us all to stay at home. Um, actually, he announced a national lockdown a week later. But because I was already looking into, um, you know, the wasteland around the post-industrial, you can say wasteland, or you can just say post-industrial land around me in West Yorkshire, where it's really the cradle of the industrial revolution. You know, I, I thought, okay, perhaps we were going to get stuck <laughs> for a long time. And perhaps this is the perfect time for me to get stuck into all these questions and try to find answers. So uh, um, when Boris Johnson asked us to all stay at home and only to go out once a day, um, I told myself I was going to embark on a year-long project, or I'll say year-long exploration. Um, I was going to photograph one, just one um, particular rhododendron bush, not far from me, at this place called Shedden Clough. Every other day um, at half an hour before sunset for 365 days, so for a whole year. <laughs> um, for some of you who might know my work, I seem to have this tendency of doing um, this kind of uh, stamina uh, oriented project. You know, I, my, first proje my first major project was to photograph the entire Yangtze River in China every 100 kilometers. So this one felt relatively speaking, easier. Um, so just to repeat, the plan is to photograph one particular rhododendron bush every other day for a whole year, always at half an hour before sunset. And the, this little site I selected is called Shedden Clough. It's right in the middle of our island. And um, a little bit background of Shedden Clough. Um, this area, 400 years ago, um, was an open cast lime mining area. Uh, the lime mining continued until about 150 years ago when canal came in. And so this area became quite remote um, in terms of, you know, remote from the most uh, convenient transportation system. And it, so the, the mines got closed and the land was really, you know, uh, left as a, as a, as a really as a mess, you can see, you know, the on your right hand side, those stones, they probably have stayed there for over 100 years. And the whole 
uh, shape of this landscape <laughs> was actually created by you know flushing water from the top of the hill to the bottom in order to flush out uh, flush off the top soil and so they can get close to the limestone and and you can see the pink flowers uh, that's a rhododendron here so about a hundred years ago the landowner at the time decided to somehow tidy up this you know um, post-industrial wasteland by changing it into a hunting estate that's when rhododendron came into this area they planted vast quantity of them now they have established themselves here so I was very interested in this land for the fact that yes it is supposed to be industrial wasteland but life seemed to you know continue this is another view from air you can see the extensive usage of this land um, I was already investigating this area a couple of years ago but I found it very difficult because um, somehow the scale the color palette the shape nothing really worked with me um, I sensed that perhaps that's because I was quite used to um, the you know the geology and geography of China and also my relationship to this land was not very clear at the time so that particular bush I told you about you can see more or less in the center of this frame that particular lump that looks quite like a you know rounded shape from the air so that's one I decided to photograph and you can see why uh, in this picture um, because it has a natural shape of a love heart I say natural actually I realized also it's a sheep who uh, keep eating the younger leaves at the bottom of this bush <laughs> so they help to trim it to this shape and I found it really interesting that this invasive plant you know particularly when, when it's flowering it, 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 it seemed to be sending out pink love <laughs> from this uh, otherwise quite barren looking moorland um, so here we go you know every other day this was walk one and uh, to encourage myself uh, to carry on I also published this in uh, Instagram so you know it's kind of an unsaid promise to my followers that they were expecting to see this every other day uh, with the stats of COVID figures at the time and then you can see on walk one there's only 71 <laughs> deaths that's 17th March 2020 few months later this was probably the peak blossom season uh, walk 41 we had more than 40,000 COVID related deaths oh I don't know what happened there so I'll try again okay um, then walk 104 <laughs> but this is by October last year we had over 43 total deaths mm. um, slow growth in that in that um, four months and walk 130 the 4th of December last year we had more than 60,000 deaths COVID related deaths and finally walk uh, 182 the very last walk for this series then on the 16th of March this year and sadly we've had over 125,000 COVID related deaths so the thing is all right let's try to play this video um, the way I wanted to use these um, photographs stills 182 stills is it's pretty straightforward um, I've edited them into a very slow um, slideshow I also worked with a composer experimental uh, music composer we collected a lot of sound samples from the area but I don't know if it'll play let's have a look
So I'm going to stop uh, the video here because I, 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 I don't really know whether you can actually um, listen and that audio. works great, yeah. That's oh, good. great. That's great. That was all fine. We we've put a, a link in Vimeo so you can actually watch the first ten minutes of it. it it's it's epic. It's thirty six minutes twenty four seconds, but the first ten minutes uh, spring section is on Vimeo. So uh, this is what we did. Um, in terms of artistic output um, with the 182 walks. But I also did some really fun things, I'll show you here. We don't need to listen to the sound, but we can try. <laughs> so this is me crawling in uh, one of a very big area of the rhododendron um, bushes. It took 10 minutes to go from one side to the other. I felt like I was pr probably pretending to be a badger. I had a GoPro on my head and, uh, you know, I recorded the whole crawling session. Um, no editing. Um, I think this will be part of, you know, the imagined um, visual audio installation. And we have another one. One moment. Da, 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 da. Okay, this one. <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense to you. So in this one, I basically used a very high definition uh, resolution macro um, lens, and I videoed the inside of one rhododendron flower. So you have this quite macro view of of the love heart. You have um, you know like a bee's view of what's happening inside the flower, and you have a badger's view. Um, so really, it was my kind of full-on investigation or exploration uh, of the rhododendrons in that area. So, you know, my work at this stage, I think for this project, really, this is the starting point of my investigation. You know, I make work to discover things. So the work really is part of that process. You know, so what have I learned from... 182 walks. I felt like I've never been so alive. I never had, I never saw, you know, so many sunsets actually rain, wind, snow, um, rainbows, uh, moon rises. Um, I felt like a kid, you know, for crawling inside the bushes. To be honest, I was quite scared to start with, and my daughter uh, took me uh, on for the first crawl. <laughs> um, this sim, you know, this conference is about death, and I suppose that sense of danger, the imagined danger of death imposed by COVID nineteen pandemic at the time, perhaps made me made my senses sharper. Every walk was really um, a full body. You know, if I if I was an ant, I probably hadn't had my antennas out, on my hair standing up to 
to receive everything that's in the air around me. Um, apart from this feeling of, you know, very much alive, that's got nothing to do with where I'm from, where the rhododendron's from, how the land is. It's this feeling of a full-on embodied connection with the elements. Um, and you see, you see nature's, uh, you know, cycles, it changes. But also the land, I have to say, the land here in England often feels more like home for me, a foreigner, with the presence of these foreign species. <laughs> and um, do our desires count less or more? And that's a question, for example, when we manage the land. And obviously, we learn about nature's resilience, its richness, its way to just go on without us. You know, the pandemic really was uh, causing so much grief in a human society. But that rhododendron, it, you know, it flowers, it has um, seed pods, it has next year's pods, it, it just carries on going without us. And I found that very somehow comforting and but what else can i learn from looking at the rhododendrons um i'll show you this little video Uh, so these are video footage I collected um, by placing two very, very cheap infrared cameras around the rhododendron area. Um, to my surprise, I found, no, I found, <laughs> I discovered so many animals that are making this land as their homes. They are taking advantage of the habitat you know, um, provided by the rhododendrons. That was a revelation. I never realized. Yes, I felt like the land was alive with all sorts of life forms, but to see them caught by the cameras, that's something else. And um, from this, I was able to think about other issues. Um, we won't watch this too little because we just watch. You know, for example, I, I really um, discovered a uh, recombinant ecology uh, in the way that uh, the species from all over the world, doesn't matter if they're native or non-native, um, they, um, you know, they coexist together. And also the South Pennines area, it was really the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. Now, because it's never been made uh, into something like a national park, a lot of these so-called foreign and uh, invasive species have had a chance to basically grow into the local ecology. So can we think of this place as a cradle of, um, you know, new cosmopolitan ecology? And also there are environmental narratives at play, you know, um, what is the value of a land? What is the value of a species? Um, according to who and for who? And, you know, these were the things going in my mind. Um, I think I'm going to, I still probably have five minutes. I'm going to quickly um, talk about a little bit of the sub-series I did. Oh, okay. Just talking about the hierarchy of knowledge, you know, we can see um, Joseph Hooker's book and uh, a painting made about him in India when the locals they knelt down to present the rhododendron to him. So I think the hierarchy of knowledge is said very clearly in this picture. And also in China, um, the Yi people, an ethnic minority group, they actually see this particular rhododendron species as the origin of their lives. Uh, so, um, you know, rhododendron to them is something a lot more than just ornamental plant. So, uh, 
while visiting the Love Heart, I also divide, um, developed another uh, sub-series called Autumn, Winter, Spring, and Summer, all to do with this one tiny little rhododendron tree, bush, shrub, how we call it. And the idea is to play with the materials that bush was um, getting rid of um, through the four seasons. For example, in autumn, I, I collected all of its autumn leaves and made them into a multi-layered uh, long scroll. So kind of an embodiment of the season and my time into this. And in the winter, I um, collected all the seed pods and set fire to them. <laughs> um, also in the winter, I found all of its uh, stillborn flower buds and I um, dissected them, all 85 of them. Finally, in the summer, spring and summer, I collected, um, sorry, it's not very subtle, this picture, uh, all of its fallen flowers. This is work in progress because the intention is to do this, is to cut it in the middle and then do soldier stitches. I think you can see where the reference comes from. Um, so I think once my body is so um, seriously put into making the work, it really brought my whole being into it. And I think there's a lot of uh, reflection on how I see gender and power in this patriarchal society, which is linked to you know the colonial past. And so what's happening now? <laughs> um, we have just released an album, With Love from Invader. I can put the link in the um, chat. Um, for the for the audio part of um, the work, and we are hoping me and Monty are hoping to then somehow find money to do a bigger project to revisit three key locations of the original areas of perhaps three iconic rhododendron species and see how landscape identity migration and perhaps environmental narratives can come together. Um, so that's that's um, where we are at. Um finally, I want to give a shout out. We need help. We need to find someone who who knows quite a lot about rhododendron pontican. Um, that's the first one of the first species introduced to this country um, at the end of 19th century. So that's probably in Spain, Portugal or Turkey. So if you know anyone who might help out um, during our field trip, please get in touch. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, fascinating. Do you want to do you want to um, stop the screen share so we can get great, brilliant. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for that. And just to start with your last question first, uh, I live in Cornwall, which has got many subtropical gardens, uh, whose pride and joy is the diversity of rhododendrons, and the gardens were often started uh, by people whose collections brought the first of the species to the country. So I think that I can give you a few links. If we connect, I can put you in touch with some of the local gardens. Thank I'm you. delighted by the question. They like the question. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, that I've, I've, got other, I've got other sort of responses as well as questions. But what about um, our, our guest first? Does anyone want to drop anything into the chat? Or, or you don't? they don't have to be sort of um, brilliantly insightful questions. I think often it's just it's when you've given a talk it's just great to hear how it landed or what struck people um while people are, are mulling we've only got a couple of minutes and then we're going to roll on to the next one because we've gone for nearly half an hour uh, but i think we started a couple of minutes late so just run it for a minute i wondered if you've seen mark dion's project Jan, where he he worked with uh there was a problem in the border area of southern texas uh where there were garden species migrating into the landscape causing a lot of problem ecological damage and they couldn't get much traction behind um, getting funding to clean them up and he organized a van with a slogan something like alien removal and, and and sort of that kind of iconography and it suddenly got a massive social response and everyone got behind it and, uh, and it was he was just very wryly pointing out the way that language operates on levels that have got nothing to do with plant removal. And, uh, yeah, and also exactly. the English artist, uh, Mark Porter, who's done a lot of work in the north of England, um, 
painting in the 90s where he would crawl up long access, inaccessible bramble covered streams and then make a painting about the crawl. You might be interested in. Got one from Charlotte. Great, I didn't see you in the audience, Charlotte. But Charlotte says, that was just wonderful, Jan. I love rhododendrons, uh, but now I'll see the ones here in Suffolk in a new and expanded <laughs> light. Thank you. And that's Mark. Hey, Mark. Mark Watson, shown as Charlotte the Can. Yes. Hey, Mark. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, there's. I I uh, I wanted to. I wondered um, where Laurel sits in this conversation because I know in Cornwall, rhododendron and laurel were often planted together, and laurel has become the out and out invasive pest, the one that just covers a woodland floor and stops everything else growing, and there's really highly energetic efforts to contain and eliminate laurel which is almost impossible to contain or eliminate uh, and uh, so they, they go to I, for a long time i was a bit vague on my laurel on the road. can i just come in there um yeah. the laurel is actually very very um, uh, invasive because uh, and they're trying to de uh, destroy it because of bees it's poisonous to bees Thanks. It's highly, highly toxic to bees. Poisonous to dogs as well. My friend's dog. Yeah. Dog yeah. Um, rhododendron has similar yeah. um, uh, things about bees as well, but not. it's not quite as toxic. Interesting. Another angle. I'm going to have to wrap it there because I'd really, I'd love to get into that. If we were in, if we were here in Dartington, we'd take this over to the White Heart in the evening over a whiskey. But we're going to have to, we're going to have to do it by private chat. But thank you, Anne. That was really interesting. And I'm going to go on now to Catherine Nelson. And sorry, Catherine, on the program, I've, I've not got the whole blurb up. So you, if, if I leave you to introduce Rory, it's a two-person okay. presentation from Catherine Nelson and her colleague Rory, the environmental tipping point. A necessary dialogue. Welcome both, and uh, over to you. And we've got thirty minutes, so when you wrap, if you want to wrap to leave time for questions, that's lovely. But uh, okay. I, will, I, will, I will cut us off at uh, uh, whatever half an hour is from now. I would. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Jan. I, th I really enjoyed the her presentation. And uh, Matt, I was wondering if you could, because it, my video, um, Roy's video, who is here, <laughs> um, it. It takes quite a long time to run, so could you run the video now, please? I will do. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Catherine Nelson, and I'm here today with Roy Nelson, and we are both going to be talking about the environmental tipping point and necessary dialogue. This presentation will concentrate on the ecological theory of regime shift, also known as the tipping point. An environmental regime is a self-maintaining system which is in balance. Therefore, the relationship between plants, herbivores, carnivores and detritivores is stable and harmonious. Consequently, a regime shift is an abrupt alteration in the composition of an ecosystem and imbalance between the original species. This is known as the tipping point, as one regime falls and another emerges. This area of concern is also the focus of an art installation by Roy and myself, which will be analysed and discussed later in the paper. Regime shift research is often concerned with the resistance and resilience of ecosystems to disturbance. Resistance of an ecosystem is about how an environmental community stays essentially unchanged when disturbed, whereas resilience is how an ecosystem responds to damage, how it res resists and how quickly it recovers. Nature is often expected to respond slowly and smoothly to any disruptive incident, but this is not always the case. Instead, there is often a sudden toppling of a regime to another. This is the environmental tipping point when the ecosystem is no longer resistant to damage and no longer resilient to change. These regime shifts are almost always negative. Regime shift can be a local phenomenon, but also can happen on a global scale. Global environmental fluctuations can be mass extinction events. Frederick Soltra and Corey Bradshaw argue that mass extinction is defined as a loss of about three quarters of all species in existence across the entire Earth over a short geological period of time. Soltra and Bradshaw continue, in fact, 
Some studies show that the interacting conditions experienced today, such as accelerated climate change, changing atmospheric composition caused by human industry, and abnormal ecological stresses arising from human consumption of resources define a perfect storm of extinction. All these conditions together indicate that a sixth mass extinction is already well underway. This mass extinction scenario is perhaps the worst possible fate that can be imagined than the global biome shift to an alternative state. Although this may be our fate, the aim of this presentation and the art installation is to describe the possibility of a local regime shift. As previously mentioned, regime shift occurs when species in the ecosystems become unbalanced. For example, when the plant-prey-predator interaction becomes disturbed. Any change in population stability may cause environmental trophic cascade, which in turn can result in regime shift. This is especially problematic when keystone species are lost through human causation. As previously described, each ecosystem attempts to resist change and be resilient to transformation. Yet a trophic cascade can occur when the predator-prey axis becomes unbalanced. A positive example of trophic cascade was the reintroduction of grey wolves to Yellowstone National Park in the United States of America. Other species populations like elk, beaver and strands of aspen became balanced leading to a more stable ecosystem. Another trophic cascade example which shows a negative change in environment when sea otters were hunted almost to extinction. This reduction in predator numbers allowed the herbivores sea urchins to rapidly increase which in turn depleted the beds of kelp. Kelp in many ways is like a marine tree. The kelp growing together are reminiscent of underwater forests. Thus they are a key species in coastal habitat ecosystems. So with the reduction of kelp other species suffered. Sea otters have since expanded their range which has allowed kelp forests to increase and subsequently the entire marine ecosystem has improved. These two examples of trophic cascade, firstly the reintroduction of the grey wolf and secondly the increase in sea otters into their former range, show how negative trophic cascade can be halted. These human endorsed changes prevented the environmental regime shift tipping point being reached with this theoretical and practical insight into regime shift described. I will now turn to the collaborative art installation Coral Lament. Overfishing, climate change and pollution in the seas around our coast inspired Coral Lament. It details a drastic reduction of the fish population which in turn has increased jellyfish blooms around the British Isles. Before I describe in detail the installation I would like to refer to a review of recent scientific research by Jennifer Purcell, Shinshi Yu and Wentong Lu. Their article Anthropogenic Causes of Jellyfish Bloom and Their Direct Consequences for Humans, a review, explains some of the consequences of human activities on the marine environment. Many human activities may contribute to increases in jellyfish populations in coastal waters. Increased jellyfish populations often are associated with warming caused by climate changes. Jellyfish may benefit from eutrophication, which can increase small zooplankton abundance, turbidity and hypoxia, all conditions that may favour jellyfish over fish. Fishing activities can remove predators of jellyfish and zooplanktonvorous fish competitors, as well as cause large-scale ecosystem changes that improve conditions for jellyfish. We conclude that human effects on coastal environments are certain to increase, and jellyfish blooms may increase as a consequence. In other words, climate change, overfishing and other anthropogenic activities are causing a change in the marine ecosystem. This may cause a trophic cascade, which, if not stopped, will inevitably lead to a regime shift if the environmental tipping point is reached. Coral Lament documents a marine environment, its past, present and possible future. It describes a tipping point of a regime shift away from fish towards an ocean full of jellyfish. Watercolour wax resist paintings of marine life 
were initially created. These were then printed onto silk organza. The light transparent fabric was then hung. Sound and text were used to narrate regime shift in this time-based installation. The inshore fish species are set out in neat columns with their common and Latin names. This is an attempt to replicate traditional reference books. The jellyfish are free roaming across the page with no taxonomic reference. This concept of naming and not naming is to narrate the past, present and possible future. Fish have been named, recorded and studied by people over centuries, whereas in the perceived future of the installation, fish and humans have become extinct. A future where there is no one there to name, record and study the new regime. The project uses underwater sound from Strangford Lock, the cry of seals and anthropogenic noise. I would now like to hand over to Roy, who is going to describe the sounds that were used for the installation in more detail. Catherine has mentioned that the artwork uses audio recordings of wildlife from Strangford Lock. These are times coupled with anthropogenic sounds from other activities such as St George's Market in Belfast. Yet, it was whilst making the sound recordings at Strangford Lock that the effect that people have on the marine environment was most clearly observed. The sound and printing equipment that we used for the project were part funded through an Arts Council of Northern Ireland award. There is a simple dictaphone recorder and an underwater microphone. The underwater microphone had a 9 metre cable and could be lowered to the depths of the lock. To give you some idea of the size of the cable it could stretch from the top of two double decker buses stacked on top of each other and would still touch the ground. Around the harbour this was felt sufficiently long. The sounds that you are about to hear were all made at this full extension and therefore were the sounds that reached that 9 metre depth. Sound waves travel very freely through the water. The first recording you are about to hear is the passenger and car ferry leaving Port of Ferry and travelling to Strangford Town. The distance between the two towns is just over one kilometre and the recording was made in the harbour at Strangford. The next recording, made at the same time, is of a small motorboat with only one occupant that suddenly arrived in the area. The sound dips in the middle where it went behind a small rocky outcrop that is an important home of a colony of common and sandwich terns. The third recording is that of the ferry arriving in the harbour and preparing to offload its passengers and vehicles. The next recording was not taken underwater but it is used in the art piece. Adjacent to Strangford along the coast, about two kilometres, there is another rocky outcrop that is visited regularly by seals. This recording is of them taken the same day and reflects the lament of the work.
We may feel that these are only transitory sounds and the wildlife would get accustomed to them. However, the School of Biological Sciences at QUB, in their Animal Behaviour Department, have a marine research lab at Portoferry where they've carried out some research into these effects. The researchers within that department have studied the effects of noise pollution on behaviour of marine species, especially crustaceans. These effects that have been observed are quite dramatic and are a major impediment to their welfare in terms of their breeding and feeding. Anthropogenic activities are having effects on the wildlife and marine environments globally. These detrimental effects are seen in both invertebrates and invertebrates such as fish and in higher mammals such as whales. These widespread effects indicate how anthropogenic activity is causing significant difficulty to marine wildlife. I'll now pass you back to Catherine. We would now like to show you the short video of Coral Lament.
The artwork was installed at the Graduate School, Queen's University, Belfast in January 2020. The exhibition was opened by Dr Ross Sylvester, the then Director of Education of the School of Arts, English and Languages, QUB. It was attended by about 32 people. Although exhibiting the work may seem like an end point, we believe that if art is going to be used as part of a transdisciplinary process of articulating environmental damage, it is necessary to question how it is perceived and understood by the public. Therefore, during the exhibition opening, notes were taken of the audience's informal response to the artwork. Such critical appraisal of art is vital when considering its value as a vehicle for cultural change. Although, as previously stated, these notes were informal and only written later, they provide some inkling into how the work was understood, perceived and appreciated. We had split the audience's in informal comments into four themes. One, incredulity and lack of knowledge of the marine situation. Is this happening here? Are those our fish? Where are those noises from? That deep? Are you saying this is happening? Two, emotional concern. Is that a jellyfish? I don't like them. Very moving, makes you think with the singing. It's like a journey. We need to do something about this. What can I do about it? Three, direct reaction to the art. Thought provoking. I love watching them up the stairs. The air makes them move. The fluttering is like it is in the water. Four, action because of seeing the art. I think this is important. I'm going to tell others they need to come here. There should be more of this. Is it happening anywhere else at Queen's? I'm interested in this for my studies. Perhaps the most interesting comments are from themes one and four. Theme one suggests that there is a lack of awareness of what is currently occurring in the marine environment. This is disturbing since there have been several television programmes, books and articles that have clearly articulated the anthropogenic damage to the seas. Yet although this information is in the press and on the internet, some individuals seem unaware of any environmental crisis in our seas and oceans. Therefore, such artworks that create a discourse on the environment placed in non-art venues and galleries are likely to engage with other audiences. This may assist in clearly communicating the dire consequences of our current activities. Team 4 provides another reason that visual art can promote positive actions. It engages its audience in communication. It provides social interaction and learning through experience. To provide an evidence-based evaluation of art which narrates the environment, we believe that this form of critical appraisal should be further developed in a more formal and deductive manner for other artworks. Finally, anthropogenic activities as described are having a huge effect on the wildlife of the global marine environment. These detrimental effects are seen through the trophic levels of the world's ecosystems. This damage is pushing the global biome to a tipping point when the environmental regime that we know and understand will be replaced by a regime that may be uninhabitable to our species. Therefore, we must become a green society. If we do not, every living creature on our planet is on borrowed time. We would like to acknowledge the help of the following people and we'd also like to thank you for listening. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, that was, I'm, it suddenly, I was just saying it suddenly paused, but it managed to complete the whole film and it only paused at the credits. So well, that I, was. That then was fact, the actual fact, the credits go on and then we look at um, <laughs> um, basically how it was received by the audience who watched it. Or not watched it, but ah. actually experienced the uh, installation. But don't worry. Don't worry, you saw the film and well, you've got what, the everyone's, link. Everyone's got the link. So why don't we, uh, by stopping now, we've got um, five minutes of, to, have, to have some kind of discussion. And then okay. people after the session can go back and pick up the last part of the film. Uh, okay. Yourself with the YouTube. Okay, Everybody. great. So, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a subject that I'm obviously very interested in and lots of people here are too. And I'm really uh, in, interested to hear, you know, what, how how the kind of how it moved the ground for you in making that and 
and how you're finding it as artists um, with the whole underlying sense of urgency about speaking to something of that magnitude as, as artists and thinkers and, and um, yeah, um, does that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, must because I'm an ecologist as well. I, I find, realize that, yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm an ecologist as much as yeah, you were um, an artist. I find the whole thing extremely sad. I'm, I'm constantly upset. You know, it's um, when you're making th things like that, you're upset all the time because you realize that. Um, I love our, our, our home at the moment. When I say our home, I mean the planet, all the plants and the animals, etc., that exist with us. And what we're doing, our species is doing, it's actually destroying those beautiful creatures and i must admit i i'm incredibly upset about it so i make this work and i think why am i doing this i'd rather go off and do something else but because it's so upsetting um and i think uh, uh i'm trying to think of um but the wor work came about because of the ecology because I am because I'm an ecologist I hear about regime shift and the regime shift is happening all the time it's happening um Jan actually talked about the invasive species in actual fact that's a form of regime shift uh, um some some invasive species are fine they're not really invasive but other invasive species are incredibly bad we have a in Britain and Ireland, we have a thing called New Zealand flatworms that's actually destroying, and they are destroying our um, earthworm population. And our earthworm population, because of um, a, each um, ecological system, is based on, you know, it, it's, in, it's, in ta it's an attack thing. And if you take the earthworms out, you're causing other damage. And it's like a, uh, how would you say it? It's, uh, it's like, it's, uh, as Roy said, he's writing next to me a keystone species, or earthworms are keystone species. And if you take, if you lose those keystone species, um, you lose your soil, not your soil, but you lose the species under it. You, like, they're affecting blackbirds, they're affecting uh, hedgehogs because we're losing so much. Um, the artwork that Roy and I made, it's about we're overfishing, as it said in the film, we're overfishing. Um, the global temperatures of the waters are going up, which also are increasing things. So everything is moving north, quite rightly. If I if I live in, in Africa, I would move north because it's too hot. The fish are doing the same thing, but eventually we will run out. We cannot move any further north. Uh, um, uh, I I just think it's a, a terrible. <laughs> I don't know. I'm smiling, but I I I uh, I can feel it a lot. I I could turn this into a sort of uh, interview with you as an ecologist, <laughs> or as an artist, and I'd really like to. I'm, I'm aware that we're in a we're in a three part panel, and I probably ought to slip out now to let Minu chair uh, Amy's final paper. But all I wanted to say is that I think. That, that sense of what you just spoke to and the answer to your question, I really hope the conversation with Jennifer Abbott at six, that's where I hope to take Jennifer and to ask her some of those questions. And mm -hmm. that maybe maybe uh, some of those things can be brought into the world in that conversation. We can pick them up again tomorrow. Um, I have a kind of sticker that actually, it, it comes up again and again and again that I, as an ecologist, I suppose you're right, it is our species doing this. As a, as a kind of, in terms of uh, a social critical study, I always want to come back to this is a culture thing, it's a form of culture. And uh, just as when she's interviewing the Sapara people in, in, in her film, um, humans are suffering this as much as orangutans and uh, crayfish and other human cultures are being exterminated by this form of culture. And how it, it, 
since the start. It is. So I it's a, kind of it's bring a, it back to that idea. You're right. It's, it's global. It's global. It's yeah, completely it's global. global. And it gives me a sense, I think, of hope that there's, you know, it's not innate to humanity. It's a sort of invasive form of culture that's taken over the human uh -huh. population. It's, it's true. It's true. You know, anyway, to be discussed. I'm going to have to dip out there to go and meet uh, uh, Jennifer. Amy, I'm really sorry to miss your session, and I look forward to catching up on the recording. So I'm going to hand over to Minu as chair, and thanks, Jan and Catherine, for your papers. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hello, Amy. Hello, Hi. everyone. I'm picking up from Matt, and um, I hope you've had a good session so far on ecological grief. Um, as far as that can be good, I don't know, but I hope it's been insightful. Um, Amy, um, I would like to briefly um, introduce you and uh, just tell you that you have, your time is uh, between now and um, 1740s or 540. Um, and we thought of having questions for five minutes afterwards. Um, for anyone who would like to ask some questions, I will do the timekeeping and I will give you come in two minutes before the 25 minutes are up so that you can wrap up in a good way. Um, if anyone wants to pin Amy as the main speaker, they can do it to it themselves. Uh, they have to pin Amy just like to do it in Zoom. Um, otherwise, welcome Amy. Uh, Amy is will be talking um, about creatively commemorating and reasserting the, nat the natural world. She's a London-based artist and researcher. Uh, her practice is informed by her PhD, which investigates public art interventions in migrant solidarity movements. So I'm going to just hand it over to you. Thank you. Um... Yeah, great. Thank you. And thanks for the organizers for sort of asking me to be part of the conference. I just wanted to start with an apology immediately because um, I wasn't able to see the previous two speakers. I am from my horticulture course like five minutes ago, um, but I'm really glad that it's being recorded. So I can um, go back and nice to hear the conversation um, a minute ago. Uh, yeah bad organization on my part um, but yeah so um, so like was just introduced so I'm an artist but a researcher as well and um, the project I'm currently working on is at the Royal College of Art and it's called Nature's Way and it basically looks at nature-based solutions for mental health um, and it's essentially trying to use design tools to support communities and individuals to initiate and innovate and engage with these types of projects um, through understanding and communicating the system that they operate within um, and then celebrating them, promoting them, connecting them with one another, hopefully inspiring others as well. Um, and we particularly are considering the importance of these types of projects given the impact of COVID um, on people's well-being and then also in the context that we're living in um, with the climate crisis. But yes, for this uh, session, um, and I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully. Uh, let's see. Sorry, a sec. Hopefully you will be able to see that now. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about two of my sort of past artworks. Um, and these are relatively recent, but pre-pandemic. Um, the first is entitled The World's Smallest Sad, or Zona de Fond, and I'll explain that term to everyone um, in case some people haven't heard of it before. Um, and that project was originally in 2000, from 2018, but it was actually recently included in, this year included in an online exhibition and a, and a publication, so that was really lovely and the second project is called um, The Wild Ascending and that was from 2019. So almost all my artworks, um, especially in the last few years, deal with ecological themes but I felt that these two projects particularly resonated um, with the themes of this of this event 
So as both bear witness to the mass ecological loss that humanity or, or some of humanity has orchestrated, particularly in the last few decades, um, they also publicly assert or reassert the natural world's continued presence through uh, small acts of created a creative resistance. Um, so to start with the world's smallest ZAD, this was initially part of a project called Aki Iala, or Here or There, which was running throughout 2018. Um, and so a number of artists based in either the UK or Argentina were sent prompts every two months um, relating to the theme of the streets or the public. Um, and the project aimed to examine contemporary practice on art and politics, particularly focusing on these two countries, which have different histories and social realities, but have both undergone you know, major political changes under neoliberalism. So the curators say, from the creation of enemies within to the enforcement of austerity policies, certain shared experiences bring us closer despite geographical distance. Um, so this project was essentially my response to the sixth and final prompt of, of the whole year, which was of the ends and utopias. Um, and yet at this point, I just say that the term ZAD originated in France around 2010 um, and references militant op occupation of land to prevent development that would harm the environment. Um, and it's often uh, associated with the high profile Zona de Fond de Notre Dame de Londres, which um, I believe started in 2012 and was this long standing battle to protect land against plans for a new airport to be built. And eventually those plans were shelved. And then there was this really long process of evictions and of actually legitimizing some of the projects that had sprung up. Um, and I'm by no means an expert on the intricacies of that whole struggle, but it's, it's a really interesting example. And there are films and books about it. So if anyone's interested, they can definitely look it up, find out more. But the concept of Azad uh, has proliferated since then. Um, and actually one of the, the movement slogans is um, Zad Partout or Zad Everywhere. So I created this miniature installation drawing on such uh, traditions of environmental protection and of traditions of imbuing plants with meanings and associations, something that's fallen a bit out of common awareness or, or use now, but was much more known back in the Victorian era, for example. Um, and so the project symbolically recreated the struggles of those who fight for more ecological futures and who do so in the face of current environmental and political turmoil. And so it became for me a personal prayer and a symbolic act of resistance and of hope, but, but concern for the future. Um, and yeah, so thinking of the idea of utopias from the prompt, um, perfect utopias are sadly impossible, but despite this, we yearn for and strive towards them, or at least some glimmer of them, uh, even as our world in many ways takes us further away. But miniature near utopias might be possible if they're shielded from the rest of the world, but they're unsustainable because they're porous. So the world pushes in on them and they can't help but to look beyond and to start to burst out of their confines. Despite this, I think that we should defend these zones. And in my view, ZADs are not only physical, but exist within us and are strengthened every time we communicate and collaborate every time we stand up and take action, sowing seeds, waiting for spring and hoping for sun. So yeah, drawing on these traditions of meanings associated with plants and then using the plants to deliver messages, the world's smallest side is a living prayer, one that grows, um, but which also reflects ambivalence about our possible futures. So it's planted with aloe, representing or wishing for healing and protection sage for wisdom, rosemary for remembrance, thyme for courage and strength, willow for sadness, dill for power against evil, violet for loyalty and devotion, and holly for hope. Um, these offerings aim to equip us with what we need to keep pushing against the current tide 
and to try and change that which is currently seen as our inevitable future. But also included are ingredients that encourage a reflection or looking back, uh, listening to other voices or questioning our assumptions. Ultimately, it is a living, it is living, joyful and defiant until the end. But um, I put the kind of unanswered question is what end or, or whose? Um, and I just wanted to yeah, mention this really great project that I was really like grateful to be included in this year. Uh, so Climate Action and Visual Culture, which was led by researchers at the University of Huddles Huddersfield in the Center for Cultural Ecologies and Art Design and Architecture. It brought 43 artists together from around the world. And I know it's not the easiest link to, to note down, but um, if you if you follow that, then you'll there's the publication, there's an online exhibition, and there's all the artist um, statements. I can also send it in the chat after if, if people want. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to return to the the project just um, briefly. So the scale of the problem that we're facing can feel overwhelming. And it completely dwarfs this fragile, tiny, mini utopia that I planted, um, which sort of can almost represent like one person's um, individual action. Um, but even if this project only intervenes and interrupts on a micro level, it's still a zad and it's still resistance of, of some kind. So it represents me taking a stand and reminding, um, reminding us of those who've done so in more practical or, or large scale kind of ways and hoping that others will join in and, and do the same. Um, and in my work more generally, I, I often aim to present or offer up natural entities themselves, in particular configurations that hopefully stimulate some sort of deeper reflection and thinking. And, and like I said, for this project, it was reinvigorating that tradition of, of giving plants meanings um, and pulling a number of plants together to communicate what I was feeling. Um, so using the plants themselves to communicate that message. But for the second project that I wanted to discuss, um, I was also intervening in public space in a kind of surreptitious small way, but using sound instead. So um, as I said, this was a project called The Wild Ascending, and it was part of Deptford X back in 2019. And I live sort of between Deptford and Newcross, so it was a festival that I was really happy to get involved with. I also really love the approach of the, or the form the festival takes. So basically anywhere in Deptford can become a venue. So cafes, pubs, the library, the church, um, as well as the street, as well as more traditional art spaces. So yeah, for the 2019 sort of iteration of the festival, I think I got around, I think it was 23 venues on board to host the installation, which was basically just having a sticker outside their building. So it wasn't too hard to convince at least most of them to, to participate. Um, and before the festival, what I did was recorded sounds from around Deptford. So these were sounds of the natural world, um, often in competition with man-made sounds. And those man-made sounds were usually related to travel. Those were very noisy species when it comes to moving about the place. And it's something we insist on doing a lot of the time. And so I created 10 different one minute long recordings, though I did little bits of editing and, and cleaning up to them. For most of them, I tried to make them as true to life as possible. So they could be really like a snapshot of the realities of, of depth at that moment in time. Though there are some where I've layered up sound to, to sort of have a particular effect. So I'm certainly not saying this is like documentary evidence. I have definitely edited some of them. But yeah, these, these audio clips were then captured as 10 different QR code stickers, which basically had the, the image that you're seeing, although each of the different 10 had different color varieties. Um, and so eagle-eyed visitors could these to these different venues could then scan the stickers and release the sounds of nature back into the street. And then visitors to the Deptford X sort of hub uh, exhibition center were also given some information on the project because it acted as a little bit of an art trail around the, around the festival. Um, and the QR, QR codes linked people to a relevant sub page on my website, which one of the 10 sounds could be played from, but you could also 
navigate back and listen to the the other nine sounds or um and find a list of all the venues and i should say that the the project got its name because um just next to Deptford Market, there's a Vaughan Williams Street. Um, Vaughan Williams Close, sorry. So Ralph Vaughan Williams being the composer of the Lark Ascending, which is my one of my favourite bits of music, um, and one which I think captures some of the essence of the project, which is like the pure joy of a single bird's song and sort of capturing that and releasing it back out, out into the world in a, in a different format. Um, and so, yeah, that was the idea behind the project really. So it was to help the natural world reclaim its space in London streets, to release the sounds of nature back into urban environments where they've been pushed out because of um, development as that accelerates, um, which is something that feels really relevant across the city and the country and the world. But, um, and Deptford is obviously, it's definitely in a process of quite intense development and, and sort of gentrification. It's changed a lot in the 10 years that I've been living here even. But it felt particularly relevant um, at that time and in that space because um, late the previous year, a kind of really well-loved community garden, garden, the Tide Mill Community Garden, um, was evicted um, for development. And evicted because people had occupied the space um, until bailiffs forced their way in early one morning and immediately started destroying the structures, even including like, you know, the tree house that was built for children. And um, I, I responded to the emergency call out by activists that morning, but by the time I got down there, the security had already surrounded the, the site. Myself and many others formed a sort of counter line, a loud and colorful and angry massive of people wanting something else than what was being forced on us. And I was going to try and play a couple of the sounds, but I haven't practiced this. I don't know if it's going to work, so I'm, I'll try it. And if it doesn't, just let me know in the chat and I'll just give up. But we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and I'll just play the second one. Okay, great. I'm so glad that worked. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that, yeah, I so on each sounds page, I put a bit of information and some suggestions for practical actions that the listener could do afterwards. So if they, you know, so were so moved by the, by the sounds. So I often link to relevant websites. So 
the RSPB's like guide to making a bird box or the Friends of the Earth um, kit for helping the bees, that kind of thing. I wanted to keep it quite simple um, to almost let the sounds speak for themselves, but I guess I did sort of nudge <laughs> people as well. Um, and I think as, as well with the other project, I find trying to stimulate practical individual action a bit of an antidote to some of the discouragement that I that I can feel myself when I'm working on such big topics, something that keeps my energies up. Um, that's not to say that um, individuals should shoulder the responsibility um, for tackling climate change um, when governments and large corporations permit and reap widespread ecological harms, but I, I think it's empowering to take action. And the more we become engaged citizens, you know, aware and active, the more we might feel willing and able to collectively hold uh, governments and corporations to account. But I also hope to use my projects as a means of encouraging a slowing down and a taking notice um, and to celebrate the pieces of the ecological puzzle that might be overlooked or underappreciated. And I think that sort of takes shape in the form of these these particular projects which are quite subtle and, and sort of small interventions um, in public space and in the case of the wild ascending i was hoping that the i hope that the effective response to the sounds would make people more open to the information on the website um and would at least open that door a crack perhaps into it like interacting with other experience they go on to have and perhaps not even being realized until some time later um and then I just wanted to close with, yeah, something that I wrote about the project at the time. So, increasingly, the sounds of nature must fight bravely against the built environment, which closes in and squeezes the bird song out, along with the rustling of leaves, the buzzing of bees. But nature will not give up so easily. It reclaims its stolen lands if you listen closely. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. Let's not lose this. And <laughs> I can stop sharing. Thank you very much, Amy. I always feel like I'm taking a pause after each presentation because it um, we enter such rich territory, mm. such different territory every time. Yeah, so just holding that for a moment. I can see um, a few questions coming through. So we have five minutes for questions. Um, from Jan Preston. Hi, Amy. Do you think that an ecological artist has to be an activist too? Um, I don't like the idea of anyone having to be anything. Um, this is definitely, this is in my PhD with a lot of the, the works I was looking at, which were all artists who were working in public space on a very highly politicized topic. There was this sort of I mean, I interviewed 40 different artists and they all had a different opinion of where they sat within that realm of art, activism, and um, it's a really complicated <laughs> territory. I feel like for me personally, I wouldn't necessarily consider my artworks to be activism, maybe engaged or, or something like that. I personally choose to do more traditional types of activism alongside, but they don't necessarily align. It's not like I work on a, like go do, so, go do something more tangible and then do a artwork about that. They can sort of each flow or be more at one time and then another. So yeah, it's a tricky one. I guess, yeah, I'm not, I guess my ultimate answer is that's up to the person and it might shift and change over time um yeah he follows up with a question mm. that says um and how much an education educational role shall an ecological artist take yeah i again i feel like it's interesting isn't it because we're i mean i'm trying to communicate something 
Um, and I'm hoping that the people who are either observing or listening to whatever, receiving the work, are, are getting something of, of my meaning. Um, but I think it's a sort of soft or loose communication rather than a direct, less black and white, you know, this is a very particular bit of evidence or information that I want you to, to learn. Um, but like I said, more of a, it's an opening a mind up to more ideas and then hoping that those that that then influences other bits of information that you take in and the way you understand the world slightly slightly differently so i suppose um, yeah it's not quite education but some form of communication but leaving i suppose the the audience to also meet you halfway and they aren't necessarily going to take on board exactly the the kind of information that you might have intended hopefully aligned with the kind of information that you intended um yeah i guess other but i guess other artists would approach things very differently depending on um the form that art takes or the how sort of direct they want their stance to be great we have another thank you amy we have another great question here which mm. is um how does going into slow time get on with activism? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, I feel like these are terms, I mean, slow time, I know something of them. I certainly haven't gone into the theory of it that much, but receptivism, I, I also see in the chat, is not something that I yeah, know much about. Yeah, a new term to learn. Um, yeah, so I don't know how to answer that one, I'm afraid. Yeah, for something there, just briefly. Mm. Um, somehow slowing down means um, to, to um, have different perceptions about things or the world around and developing, and it kind of helps to develop new organs of how do we perceive and how we know and some people would say this is a delicate more delicate form of mm. activism that happens more internal rather than mm. external i mean i like what you just said yeah that 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 rings that rings true for me i i think yeah but i, I don't think i've got anything clever to add <laughs> No, that's fine. It was just um, <laughs> just popping to my mind. Um, please, if anyone has other questions, pop it in the chat and I will ask Amy. I would like to ask you if these two projects are still ongoing or if you have something else planned. Yeah, I guess I, I have... It's an in interesting time because I was, I was away in... Peak District for the sort of first four or five months of this year um, and I've kind of come back to London recently and I'm kind of now starting to think okay what am I doing next after a period of of getting my bearings again I like I do like doing stuff in public space and I really like working with sound and I think there's a real potential with sound that sometimes it can get overlooked um, as a, a sort of art form, a few of my projects are, have been sound based and I'm, it's definitely something that I would like to work with again. Maybe not, maybe not in exactly the same form, but something which sort of, I don't know, something which, I don't know, as someone walks past it gets, it gets triggered so that it sort of does quite take you by surprise or kind of in an unexpected way. It's not something that I've put my thoughts into. I'd, I'd also like to do more with them. I really like this, the meaning of plants. Like there's so many, you know, there's so many different, I, I've i also worked with planting different things and making a sort of garden, which is all meaning based. And yeah, I think they're both avenues I'd like to pursue, but yeah, no concrete form as yet.
Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so much thank you so much for sharing um your work with us amy um amazing yeah amazing work everyone's doing um truly um rich and full of full of depth so thank you very much um i want to also uh tell everyone if anyone wants to have a chat with a presenter. They can uh, create kind of individual personal breakout rooms um, in breaks and continue chatting. We had some really wonderful questions here. Thank you very much for those who posted the questions. Um, and for everyone else, um, the evening continues. There is a short break now until six o'clock and um, at six, we have a 40 minute keynote uh, talk interview between Matt Osmond and um, Jennifer Abbott, the director of The Magnitude of All Things. Um, and then at, then there is a 20 minute break and at seven o'clock there is an evening session with, with more. Um, wish you all a good evening and thank you Amy, and thank you everyone for presenting. Thank you everyone coming into the space. Um, yeah, have a nice evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.